Welcome everybody um, to this webinar on wastewater surveillance in non sewer settings, an important um, topic um, for an important uh, set of settings um, where, and you will hear today uh, about the value and, and how you can go about in these non sewer settings where um, a large proportion of the, of the world's population is not connected to a sewer. So it's good uh, to see the explorations of uh, people that have been working in these settings and learn from their experiences uh, as an inspiration for um, more work uh, on how this can, uh, can go about in these types of settings and where the value can be. So we have um, a series of uh, presenters. Um, I am kicking off and to say some words about the cluster and that th this webinar is part of. Um, Sudhir Pilar from the Water Research Commission in South Africa will talk about non sewer settings in general. And then uh, Gina Pokop from the Water Lab and Fiona Els from the National Center of Infectious Diseases in South Africa will talk about the experiences in non sewer settings in South Africa. Then uh, Lishan Wanigama uh, from the Chula Longorn University um, and the Memorial Hospital in Thailand uh, will present the Thai experiences. Uh, and uh, Petros Sigvel Chokya at Malawi University of Science and Technology in Malawi will present um, the experiences that uh, he and his team have on uh, Malawi and the application to One Health. Then um, Dilip Abraham from the Christian Medical College of Valor in India uh, will uh, talk about the insights that he has uh, and his team have uh, gained in, uh, the, in the area of Valor in India. And then we close um, with um, a panel discussion and uh, I'll go about how you can uh, raise your questions in this uh, webinar and um, Sudhir uh, Pillai and myself will um, convene this discussion. So. Um, the, the the webinar is recorded uh, and it will be available on demand afterwards on the IW Connect Plus platform. Um, uh, so you will uh, be able to see and share uh, or send other people uh, to see this uh, this webinar. Um, copyright is on the speakers and you see the other uh, elements. Um, it's the speakers' uh, responsibility and do not necessarily reflect IWA opinion. For general information, um, requests uh, or inactive activities, use a chat box. For your questions, please use uh, the Q&A box to send questions to the panelists. And we will try to answer already, um, well, after their presentations, they will make an effort to, uh, to answer questions. And we will select uh, questions uh, for the, the general uh, Q&A afterwards, the panel discussion. So use the Q&A box for your questions, the chat box for um, technical issues with the, the webinar. This is us. You'll uh, probably also see us um, on, the, on the camera uh, screen and when we are uh, presenting. I was going to tell you something about um, the IWA cluster on wastewater-based epidemiological surveillance. This was launched um, last June at the, the, the Specialist Group Health-Related Water Microbiologies Conference in Darwin, in Australia. Um, and it is a cluster of um, specialist groups within IWA uh, with a vision to create a global platform of professionals and institutions for rapid information exchange and dialogue uh, within water and certainly also in this field between water and public health. So what we're doing today is part of um, the activities to, um, to rapid info exchange and dialogue. Uh, and uh, we will also see um, uh, if, if we are meeting the objective of uh, having a dialogue between water and public health in the survey I'll do in a, in a minute. So the, uh, the general idea of the, of the cluster is that the different um, specialists within IWA, the people that are knowledgeable on microbiology, knowledgeable on, on drainage systems, knowledgeable on non sewer settings, for instance, they uh, join forces in a cluster and talk about this wastewater surveillance um, in a more integrated manner than uh, uh, only from their uh, respective disciplines. And of course, um, we from the water sector, we need to connect to public health and vice versa uh, to make this um, wastewater surveillance for public health uh, valuable and actionable. 
So this is the uh, the people of today. Yes, want to, to like you draw your attention to the next cluster activity, um, and that uh, that will be at a, a Toronto the in the World Water Conference uh, an exhibition of the IWA, and there will be. Um, a cluster workshop on the value of wastewater surveillance for uh, for public health. So um, tune in uh, there again. Um, but first, of course, enjoy uh, and and learn from what we are sharing today. Thank you. And uh, with that, um, I hand over to Sudhir. I'm just doing an introductory uh, talk uh, to set the tone for the rest of the presentation. And uh, I restructured it a bit. I just wanted to say the why, the what. And the how will come later. So what are non-sewage areas? It's any place that does not have a connection to a sewer. Uh, why is this important? And I think when you look at it from a surveillance uh, point of view, uh, the gray water or washing water will just be discharged into a toilet or to the environment. Uh, you have fecal sludge. So there's a big difference in terminology which we use for non-sewage systems. Even within that, you can have some muddling. You can, you know, non-sewer and, uh, and on-site sanitation systems are quite similar. But you then you tend to have fecal sludge or you have these new generation on-site recycling type of systems. Uh, it's quite different to how you would uh, do wastewater, traditional wastewater surveillance from a sewer system. We're looking at the sanitation value chain. And if you can have a look, usually you can get the... Uh, a sample at the head of works or yeah. at the effluent. So you usually get a sample at the head of works or you get from the effluent for wastewater part. Okay, for fecal sludge or for from a non-sewer type of system, you can sample any of these areas. So, so you could look at the toilets itself. You could look at the emptying, how it's collected through in honey sucker trucks or collected sludge or some type of vacuum type of system. You can even look at the treatment plant. So this is the variability that exists when you look at non sewer areas. We're just going to go. Now, these pictures that are, are being shown are actually from the same location, more or less the same location. And if you have a look, each of those toilet systems is slightly different and how they built is slightly different. Okay, so you might have a hole in the ground, you might have a different type of pedestal, you might have a concrete pedestal. And the type of waste that you're generating from non solid systems is quite difficult and challenging. Okay, even the ways you try and collect it. The first picture is from Malawi, and as you can see the hole to actually access, access the sludge uh, from the non solid system is quite small. So you have to have quite, um, you know, innovative sampling devices. B is from South Africa. Usually you need a, a pit cover and you have to use a shovel to take it out. You do have pictures from C. Uh, I think that's from Malawi where you need a honey socket to try and take out some of that. It's not only the sludges from the toilets, but also the run over the gray water because that's also doesn't have a place to go in a non sewer environment. So these are the different types of sampling locations that you can look at. Uh, for non sewer systems. And it's just showing you the difficulty in trying to develop a non sewer surveillance type of system. Okay. Uh, one of the issues, you have a heterogeneous composition. So you could have a mixture of urine or feces. It could also be separated. You can even find from house to house, there might be variability. Uh, even within the same area, you might have different types of toilets and it comes to regulatory and standards variability, especially on designs and regulations. How it's stored is also quite different uh, from a latrine uh, to a septic tank. Uh, and, and the design also, some may be stored for years. Uh, and so this brings out a, a layer of complexi complexity when it comes to non sewer areas and, and how to do surveillance. It's not a composite sample that's coming through where you have a, a more or less similar type of range. It's highly variable. This is some of the results you can find uh, online from some papers. If you look on your far right, that's from your sewage and waterborne system. So if you just look at COD itself from 500 to 2000, but if you look at sludges, 
it can be 90,000 to 10,000 or even less. So this is the type of variability that you're dealing with. And I just put some pictures of sludges um, and the variability of some of them, you know, different types of stuff inside. You might have solid waste. You might not have solid waste. You might have people washing. You might have toilet paper. And this is the type of variability, variability in types of uh, non-sewage sensor systems. So the challenge of non-sewage surveillance is, as I mentioned earlier, is variable characteristics. It's much more variable than from a wastewater treatment works. Variable sampling sites. One of the issues that you find is it's also not a regulated site. So it's not like at a wastewater plant where you might have formalized or regulatory or SOPs or training required for sanitation workers. You would probably have to develop that. Uh, Mention some of these other things, variable per site and country, either, especially on design, where the people wash or they wipe. You might have a dry system, you might have a flushing system, you might have water ingression. And there's other places where you would probably look at the grey water. Some of the other things you need to look at, you know, it needs to make sense, but there needs to be a business case and needs to differentiate itself from, from clinical testings. There are also issues on long-term financing. Uh, how do you do this long-term financing? Does it fit under water and sanitation supply? Does it fit under uh, a public health department or is it a merger of two? These are some things that need to be looked at. And maybe a citizen science approach, especially for SOPs for sampling and collection analysis. You know, We've seen this book that's come out a couple of years ago, Methods for Fecal Sludge Analysis. Uh, it was developed primarily because of the difficulties of measuring non sewer areas, especially for the sludges. And you could see they had to bring a whole lot of methods uh, together just for that, that variability that exists. And then the question we should ask ourselves is, should we include this into this type of textbook or should we develop a separate technical guidance document for non sewer sanitation systems? And this is for across the world. Well, you know, South Africa is quite different from, from Asia. We tend to use uh, more dry type of systems here compared to Asia or places where they wash. So should we bring all of this information into some type of technical guidance document? So that's the, I said, I'll be quick and fast. Uh, how would it benefit developing countries? Now, one of the things is social distancing during COVID in urban slums, very difficult. You also had shared water and sanitation facilities. You're asking people to have social distancing, but you also have shared facilities. It's quite difficult. Uh, accessibility and affordability to medical care. You know, one of the things that Africa experienced during the COVID pandemic was our borders kept on getting shut down every time we detected some type of new strain. It's the first time we detected it. doesn't mean it originated here. Uh, we've also seen inequity when it comes to, to vaccines and, and cold supply chains for those type of things. So having another tool in the arsenal for non sewage areas, a surveillance tool for the developing world, which tends to have more non sewage systems, really help because you probably could do one test for maybe 10,000 or 1,000 people. Uh, it saves on test kits and those type of things. Um, I, I remember even myself during the onset of the pandemic, uh, when we first started, I was in contact with one of the first cases in, in the country. Uh, they said, if you're not feeling sick, we don't have enough kits. Just stay at home for 14 days. Um, you know, something like this uh, from the surveillance side would really help the non sewer and developing countries. So uh, that's the end of my presentation. Thanks. Thank you. We're staying in South Africa with uh, Tina Pocock from the Water Lab and Fiona Els from the NICD. Hi, uh, good afternoon, everybody. I hope you can all hear me. Um, my name is Gina Pocock, and I'm from Water Lab in South Africa. I'm going to be sharing this presentation with Fiona, as Khaychan said. Fiona Else is from um, the NICD, the National Institute for Communicable Diseases. Um, she also collaborates collaborates with the Gauteng City Region Observatory. And we've worked together with um, the University of Pretoria on the study. And it was funded in part by the Water Research Commission. So I'm going to speak to you about um, our SARS-CoV-2 surveillance in non sewage settings in South Africa to build on what Sudhir was saying. All right, so wastewater surveillance um, has recently emerged as a flexible and robust method to monitor infectious diseases. It was used in various countries to monitor SARS-CoV-2 during the COVID pandemic, and more recently it's also been used to monitor other pathogens like uh, 
influenzas and cholera and typhoid and other enteric diseases and viruses. Um, however, we need wastewater infrastructure to be in place for this to work effectively with effective sewage collection systems delivering all the wastewater to the wastewater treatment works that serves that area, um, which can then be sampled. Right, South Africa does have a functioning and representative wastewater surveillance system for SARS-CoV-2. This is located at Sentinel site wastewater treatment plants. Um, this program has been very successful in monitoring levels of, of COVID and also the genotypes of, of the various variants circulating in our population. However, we should note that 43% of our population, I suspect it's more than this now, it's a slightly old statistic, is not collected, connected to a sewer network. Um, also in our metropolitan areas, in our cities, um, upwards of 16% of people are living in informal dwellings around the rivers. Environmental surveillance in unsewered areas is presently very underutilized, although the data pertaining to this wastewater surveillance in this context will have global reference. And we should apply it together with surveillance of sewered wastewater systems. So we developed a conceptual framework to help us understand what approach to take to evaluate this environmental surveillance to sample from these unsewered settings. The challenge though is to relate this environmental sample data to the relevant population. It's not as easy as when you're working with a sewer system where you know exactly who's contributing. And then to correlate this with the confirmed clinical cases in the area. So to actually, um determine the true SARS-CoV-2 disease burden, we would need our uh, geolocated SARS-CoV-2 clinical cases, which is collected from, from people who test um, with a swab in the, in the nose or in the throat, um, and then also the measurement of SARS-CoV-2 levels in wastewater. So the NICD mostly does that part of um, monitoring and surveillance. So they do the routine wastewater surveillance in South Africa. Then we also collaborated with the Gauteng City Region Observatory who has socio-demographic data who can tell us um, when, why are um, our SARS-CoV-2 cases underreported and who is connected to the sewer network. Then we also formed a collaboration with the Water Lab who did the measurement of the SARS-CoV-2 uh, levels in the rivers and the surface runoff to specifically look at these unsewered communities. Uh, next slide, Gina. So we really needed an interdisciplinary co collaboration. The big um, challenge we had was how do we fit these data sets together to actually draw meaningful um, conclusions? Next slide. All right, so our aim was to characterize populated areas where wastewater samples were tested for SARS-CoV-2 to better understand the relationship between these communities and the findings of the environmental surveillance. So our objectives um, included identification of specific sites where surface water and rivers are impacted by these informal communities, then to collect those samples um, and also developing sample methodologies and quantify them for SARS-CoV-2 in these non sewer settings in densely populated areas, specifically of the Gauteng province in South Africa. Um, then to characterize these catchment areas in terms of the, this is the topography and the drainage profile, and then looking at the population demographics and the quality of life at these sample collection sites. Um, and then to geolocate the laboratory confirmed SARS-CoV-2 cases to these catchment areas, and finally to describe the relationship between environmental SARS-CoV-2 concentration the demographics, and then the laboratory confirmed cases. So in terms of our methodology, we aim to look at more of a descriptive study here to determine the causal and contributory relationships regarding the incidence of communicable disease and social determinants of health. As I mentioned, we focus our study on Gauteng. It's the most densely populated province of South Africa. It's also the smallest, um, and it has many rivers, 46 rivers. Um, we purposely identified four river sampling sites within the city of Ikerleni and the city of Johannesburg that are impacted by these untreated surface runoffs from informal settlements. Um, we looked at the Bless Book Sprait, which is point A on our map, and the Coal Sprait, which is point B from um, Ikerleni, and then the Yekske River and the Clip Sprait, point C and D on the map. Uh, we're going to share the results from one of these sites. Uh, that will be point A, the Bless Book Sprait. Right, just to take you through our sample types, um, for those who haven't dealt with these types of settings before, 
we evaluated various samples and sample types, um, but we ended up sticking with uh, grab and passive samples uh, for continued observation. So we, as I say, we, we assess these two sample types, the grab and the passive samples. When you evaluate these types of samples initially, we found that the rivers provided a more stable sample point, obviously than gray water pools or surface runoff, which was temporary or more transient. Although we did still include these when they were available, when we went into the areas and there were pools after rainfall, um, we would sample them those as well. Um, our passive samplers were 3D printed devices. Uh, there's plastic samples on the bottom right. Um, we packed them with gauze and then we covered them in shade cloth just to prevent fouling. And they anchored these in the river for a period of time. We tried both 24 and 48 hours, both had um, Good results. The 48 hours are specifically useful in high dilution periods like after rainfall. Um, we eluted the virus from the gauze in the lab and this passive sampling was also done in with the grab samples in a subgraph here just to show you the kinds of results we got from these different sample devices for those who are interested. Um, you can see these are CT values so the lower the CT the higher the viral load in the, in the sample. Um, the target SARS-CoV genes that the passive samplers picked up. Um, it was all able to pick up the virus during the interwave periods. So my, my orange and gray gray bars there are where we've picked up um, the gene targets. So you can see in the grab samples there, sort of in September of 2021, we were in an interwave period without a lot of positive results. But in the passive sample, we actually did pick up some positive. So it just shows that when the viral concentration was low, um, passive samples were very useful because they were in there for a longer time. And this would also obviously apply during rainfall when the dilution factor was higher. Uh, so if we look at the results coming from these samples, uh, we mapped out our sampling point here on the uh, left hand side. So um, our sampling site was upstream of a um, settlement. So at the bottom left hand side, you can see that they are densely populated um, areas around the river. Um, in this wastewater graph at the top, you can see that there's positive cases plotted against the wastewater cases, and we actually found our SARS-CoV-2 concentrations um, a little bit higher, mostly um, conf uh, over the positive cases. And you can specifically see the, the Delta wave and the Omicron wave. Um, when you look um, at the bottom graph, you can also see the specific um, Delta wave and the Omicron wave when you look at the positivity rate, incidence rates, and testing rates. If you specifically look at the quality of life um, data, uh, just next slide, Gina. Uh, the, the population density for this sampling point on the left uh, is about seven times higher than that of in the city. Um, these communities are also very impoverished. They um, have an income of less than 1,600 Rand per month which is about, I want to say, 400 US dollars. Um, there's also 7% of them that live in informal dwellings, and water is mostly only piped into the yard and not into their house. So um, also just to give you an indication of the circumstances that these people live in. Uh, next slide. So what we actually found was uh, these positive results in the river indicate that these rivers are used for sanitary purposes. Or it could be just that there's an, a broken infrastructure, uh, wastewater pipe that actually feeds into the river, uh, which is also concerning. But access to care in these informal settlements are, are really limited. They have higher vulnerability um, because of this. They, they, they don't have clinics to go to or they don't, they don't act necessarily have access to hospitals. And this could have an impact on disease transmission and severity. Uh, especially if patients don't get treatment on time because uh, they can sit with an illness for a long period of time, don't get tested, and uh, the disease uh, goes to severe disease. So what we really need to do is uh, strengthen these environmental surveillance in these marginalized communities because this can bridge the gap for vulnerability. When we really see that the wastewater cases are high at a certain period of time in a certain community, um, we can implement control measures over there. Uh, so when environmental surveillance um, indicate higher concentrations of disease, we can have additional support. 
or services for these communities. Next slide. Uh, as Gina just mentioned, sampling logistics can really be difficult and time consuming. Um, and they they require support from multiple stakeholders and multiple parties. So usually uh, we need permission from municipalities and river action groups and community leaders who would help us get into the community to help us sample from there, um, get the necessary um, permissions. Also, transport of large volumes of water is costly, and we need to maintain the cold chain, which is often also difficult in these areas because most of the time they don't have electricity or, um, you know, running water into their household. And dilution in during rainy season may also hinder detection, but passive sampling may overcome these issues, um, especially during the high dilution periods, because it allows for a cheaper and easier transport uh, also improved consistency and the sample processing is quicker and the logistics of the passive samplings are onerous and uh, they do require community assistance you know we want to we want to put our passive sample sampler into the river and keep it there and hope no one steals it and hope it doesn't wash away um, so we really um, need capacity building and community champions who can assist us with um, protecting the sample and helping us with the sample. Next slide. More key lessons um, is that these urban streams represent a high, rich and highly relevant source of information about exposure to pathogens. So here we can really monitor communities um, emerging contaminants, uh, lifestyle indicators, and antimicrobial resistance. Uh, environmental surveillance can also help us inform clinicians and public health authorities on the true disease burden that we can find in these communities when, they, when testing is not available, and help them with health services um, in the marginalized communities. The traditional clinical surveillance that we do at clinics and at host hospitals can also be strengthened to include this wastewater surveillance um, as a complementary tool where we can actually report to policymakers in real time. So these will be our, our champions and our people in the communities, our dist district health officials. We can also report to public health officials on a dashboard, um, which can then make decisions on whether we, we do a vaccination campaign or we, we warn our other clinics. So samples can be used for wastewater-based epidemiology for a broad scope of pathogens using the same methods applied for SARS-CoV-2. So we don't actually only monitor for SARS-CoV-2 anymore. Our lab also monitors for measles and rubella and influenza um, and hepatitis. So that's the great thing about wastewater surveillance is um, it's flexible. It can easily be adopted for any pathogen that you need. Next slide, please. Uh, the, the final challenges that we that we really experienced was how do we start these collaborations? We were really lucky in the sense that we knew someone who knew someone <laughs> who knew someone. And eventually we could get into um, communities um, and we could get people who could help us test it, test and people, other people can help us analyze data. But we really needed to get the buy-in from the community. Um, which was which was the key to this study. The, the, the sharing of information with this community was also a challenge, um, sharing them, sharing it in a way that they will understand what is happening. And um, what do we do when we have an increase in cases? Do we do vaccination campaigns? Do we ask for extra um, medical clinics, extra people to get onto site? Um, that's, I, I mean, that's the next step, but that's that's really the impact of of the study. And that's it from our side. Thanks. Super. Thank you, uh, Fiona. And thank you, uh, Gina. That we quickly move to um, to Thailand, uh, to Lishan Wanigama uh, for his presentation. Lishan. Okay. okay. Thanks, uh, Hadima. Thanks for the IWA for the organizing this, actually. So I'm a uh, Alishan Wanikama and uh, good afternoon for all of you. So I'm an infectious disease physician. I'm based in Thailand and Japan. So most of my work is about South and Southeast Asia. So I'll talk about how the non sewer based water surveillance can address the health equality or it can show the disparities in that. So, yeah. So I think 
previous presentations, all the speakers actually resonate this message, what's the use of uh, wastewater testing results. And I think it's, it's very clear that uh, we can get a valuable information from the wastewater testing, but I think the, when it comes to non sewer wastewater surveillance, it's also that we can still uh, specify the population surveillance, we can early detect outbreaks and surges and variant of concerns and population-wide surveillance. So it's, it's, it's still valuable compared to the wastewater treatment plant-based surveillance. And moving on that, so uh, why we need uh, non sewer surveillance? Actually, the question is remain in this presentation. You can see the answer that there's a large proportion of people in the world actually not connected to the proper sewer management system. So if it's surveillance based on sewer, like a sewer, um, sewer like a maybe based on a treatment plant like that, we are unable to uh, see the what will happen in what's going on with the internal infectious disease for the people who are not connected to that system. And that's created the inequality. And we kind of uh, neglect those people and we might take up uh, decisions and interventions uh, without understanding that dynamics. So that's why non sewer wastewater surveillance is very important, especially for low and middle income countries. And also these are the countries highly vulnerable for the climate change. So that's mean that more spillover events can happen and they do not have a infrastructure enough to cope with that. So that's why having a non sewer wastewater surveillance is important for to find out these outbreaks or emerging pathogens in this region so we can address is these issues very early. So moving on that, actually, you can see these two pictures uh, resonate what I am try to explain in this presentation. You can see that some of the developed cities or it's like a very large class of cities in Southeast Asia, we have still have a, this kind of like low income settings or maybe uh, small communities within the developed environment. And then we also have this open markets, which is basically poultry industry and also fresh markets. And they all are spillover events. And also these both are not connected to sewer systems. So that's why uh, non-sewer wastewater surveillance can actually monitor these locations and identify the clusters and do a, a proper uh, epidemiological or public health interventions and that can benefit for the society. Then also these uh, non sewer wastewater surveillance can also segment it to different facility wise as uh, basically seen in this illustration, we can look at the community market, so shopping centers, community houses, entertainment venues, and then we can look at these individual locations uh, through the in the community, and when, when these all those uh, these locations are non sewer settings, and then we can identify symptomatic and asymptomatic transmission dynamic within that community. So we can make a public health decisions or what we have to do for in terms of intervention that based on specific these particular facilities using the non sewer wastewater surveillance. So that's why it's very segmented or granulated approach in terms of public health approach, uh, surveillance approaching. And so moving on that, actually we had done a large scale study on that. This work has been already been published. So this is a pilot study we did since beginning of COVID pandemic in Thailand covering suburban areas as well as rural areas. And which is segmented to condominium complexes, cafeteria, community and food markets, offices, and these all are entertainment venues, work sites, housing complex, they all are non sewer wastewater uh, settings. And then we also have a wastewater treatment plant to see the differences. And we use the standard grab sampling method and followed by the molecular de detection as well as everybody use it in there. And using this method, uh, this surveillance, uh, non sewer surveillance, we can clearly show that how the COVID 19 transmission dynamic in Thailand. So in uh, you can see in the first panel in A, which is the number of reported cases in this particular areas changed through the time period from 2020 to 2021. And then the middle panel is how the uh, wastewater reflect that case differences actually. And then the last is how the variant being changes in these communities because we can do the segmented variant surveillance on this non-sewer wastewater surveillance. It's a settings and then we can 
see that which variant shift in which particular timing of this these particular locations like that. So this can provide the public health information in real time and also address the health inequality same time. And as you can see that in using this method, we can estimate the in, uh, infection incidence by using wastewater numbers. And we can also see when the timing and the period like where the no cases were reported, but how the wastewater start early picking up. Like in this study, we found out that the urban areas, the non sewer wastewater surveillance can pick up 14 days early before the cases show up and the rural area, it go up to 20 days early. We can sh show in the, we can see the changes in the wastewater or increase in trend in the wastewater uh, using this method. Sure. Not only the um, presence of uh, COVID RNA concentrations, but it's also can see how the dynamic of the variant changes. So we can see uh, in this that we able to track when the first variants like alpha and delta presence in the country before the first cases are reported. And also how it was changed between suburban areas and rural areas. What's the relative abandoned dynamic of this location using the non sewer wastewater surveillance. And also we can see the facility-wide dynamics. So you can see in here the one of the message I uh, resonated earlier that you can see the wastewater treatment plan all over the time period remained kind of similar dynamics compared to the facilities, which is other places where the non-sewerage settings show very you know, different dynamics. So, and that dynamic we can only see through the non-sewer wastewater surveillance. So then we can see uh, how the things change through the pandemic in different settings. And based on that, we can make the public health interventions and the action to those things. And that uniqueness actually different between suburbs and rulers. So, so you can see the differences very clearly using the non sewer wastewater surveillance. Not only that, actually, by using this uh, non sewer wastewater surveillance, we can see how the public health intervention being affected in this particular location. So you can see that uh, in the gray area in both graphs, which is relevant to the, when the Thailand had a lockdown or very uh, strict reinforcement. And that during that time, how the variants uh, of, I mean, the wastewater based incidents were changed and where the settings it go lower and where the setting is remain still constantly increasing. And then we can implement the public health uh, interventions according to this data. So the non sewer wastewater surveillance, the only one can actually provide this information very clearly because uh, we can provide very granulated information that where the action should be necessary like that. And moving on that actually, non sewer wastewater surveillance not only uh, relevant to SARS-CoV-2, be able to also detect the emerging in infections like MPOX, when the MPOX outbreak happened in the Europe and uh, Northern America sites, when the before Thailand report the first cases in uh, be able to track it one month ahead. And you can see that uh, using non sewer wastewater, all these positive locations are non sewer locations and be able to track them very early stage. And we also able to connect them to the, uh, the cases reported lately and how the transmission dynamics been happening. And not only that, actually, we also able to show the genetic diversity because we collect sample from different locations and they might be uh, served by different population of people. So we can see how close as they are, uh, how, how, uh, how genomic close to the ongoing pandemic and where they are all originated. So this genetic diversity we can show by using the non sewer wastewater surveillance. And then we expand this to the uh, six different countries, actually in Southeast Asia, some of the countries, it was the first time reporting the wastewater surveillance data like Myanmar, Laos and Cambodia, and also in Indonesia. And we also able to show how the transmission dynamics in this among these countries, how it, the variants are being changed and go, uh, according to the ongoing pandemic. And that's information, all of these places were positive is a non sewer wastewater surveillance location. So, Thanks to that, that's why we're able to show this very clear, this transmission dynamic in the region. 
and not only uh, measuring the emerging infection, it also non surveillance sort of surveillance can highlight the emerging new variants. Like here, example is a BA 2.86. We are the first to report BA 2.86 present in Asia because uh, when it uh, first reported in, in the European side, we able to track it very early and all this location were non surveillance sort of surveillance locations. And also very uniqueness of this is that this location showed different genetic relationships. So it's mean that within small geographical location with short of time frame, we can see how the variants are changing. And because this difference, you can only see it's all a non surveillance sort of surveillance uh, settings. So we can get the samples from unique locations and that differences can be highlighted that. So this work with published on Lancet infectious disease. And then we move on that to, we start tracking the BA 2.86 and JN1 in Southeast Asia covering almost 12 different countries. And, and same as like some of the countries was the first time for Sri Lanka, Timor East, and also for Philippines. And we cover how the BA 2 points, how quickly change and how JN1 arrives and how the concentrations and how the genetic diversity has been changed in these all the locations. So that's why non all our non surveys for the uh, settings and Using this surveillance, we can clearly see this difference as very early stage of the variant transmission. So in summary, actually, this uh, non sewer based water surveillance I see as a participatory approach. I think Sudhir has uh, explained about this citizen, uh, citizen science approach, and they can provide more information in clinically trained frame. And non sewer waste water actually uh, able to distribute infection across the different facilities. We provide the equitable approach for wastewater monitoring. We address the both sides of the society. We also promote usefulness of the risk assessment, vaccine effectiveness, patterns of healthcare utilization. And also, it's very cheap and flexible and scalable according to the location. And also, it's, it's, it can be Calibrate according to unique diseases, and also it's uh, can be adapted to the low and middle income countries with poor sewer systems or low resource uh, communities. Actually, so with that, actually, I'll finalize my talk. Again, I want to thank the, my team, Pathogen Hunter Research Team, and all the collaborators. I can't include everyone's name here. I also especially thanks to all the volunteer and marginalized and LGBTQ communities who help us to collect these samples, thanks to them. And also our team is actually represent all the ethnic and gender minorities, as well as LGBTQ and also individual living with disabilities. And I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Lishan. We are, um, yeah, it, it really shows the picture of how it can um, work and uh, not only Thailand, but uh, broader in, uh, in Southeast Asia. Um, we quickly move back to um, to Africa, to Malawi, um, and we will have the presentation by Petros uh, Chokia, sorry Petros, um, from uh, Malawi University of Science and Technology. Right. Uh, thank you so much. Um, uh, my apologies. I'll not be able to switch on the video. Uh, we have very poor internet this side. I think over the past few days, the internet has not been very stable. Uh, my name is um, just to to to, uh, to provide more context to the name. It's actually Petros Chigwechoka, and I'm a senior lecturer at the Malawi University of Science and Technology of Molecular Biology. And the, really, here I want to share some of the the, the key challenges uh, that we've faced in trying to establish um, an unsured wastewater surveillance system uh, in in a in a, in a low in a in a low resource setting. Uh, the case of um, uh, Malawi. Yeah, so um, uh, I'll start by uh, providing a very brief um, uh, uh, description of our uh, sanitation profile here in Malawi. Uh, I think yeah, as a country, we are still doing uh, very poorly on, on sanitation. Um, I can isolate issues of, for example, households, uh, household hygiene. Uh, for household hygiene, we still stand at 8% uh, of um, the population. That's, that's a very poor statistic. Uh, there are a number of efforts that are being done to improve uh, the statistics here. And the, we hope that in the next the decade, I think in the next few years, uh, the statistics that you see here will be much, much better. 
Um, uh, now, Malawi, just like uh, most of the South, uh, Sub Saharan Africa, uh, remain very behind in terms of uh, uh, sewer sanitation. We only have 7% uh, of our population covered uh, within the sewer. So, most of our sanitation uh, uh, actually system remains unsewered. And uh, uh, here I want to share some of the key experiences um, uh, setting up um, uh, a surveillance system uh, in non um, um, uh context. Um, generally, for the for most of the low and middle income countries, um, uh, waste water surveillance has lagged behind. And the, uh, in the case of Malawi, as I've mentioned, most of the uh, population are using on on site sanitation, which is the uh, unsewered. And this really creates uh, challenges regarding fecal sludge management, um, especially in the uh, context uh, that the uh, uh, pit emptying services are unavailable. And if they are available, they are <clears throat> often very expensive. And the, that ultimately leads to abandonment of uh, those pits once they are full, and the, which creates a, quite a huge uh, public health uh, problem. Now, <clears throat> with this context of the, the 92% uh, relying on the on site sanitation, uh, utilization of um, uh, wastewater based epidemiology, WBE, uh, to monitor community health has been very difficult and almost impossible uh, for countries like uh, Malawi. And in such a case, we have to depend on uh, clinical data uh, to, 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 to look or to review uh, community health status. But unfortunately, such data is also occasionally unavailable. And in most cases, if, if it's available, it's actually very unreliable and you can't make sense out of such. <clears throat> so one of the major challenges that we, uh, we've we observed um, uh, trying to set up uh, Nansua, the West Water Sanitation, is that we really have to operate in very, uh, very, uh, what I would call in quotes, nasty environment, because you can see uh, some of our teams collecting samples here. This is not an ideal environment. And some of the team members that we had started with actually ended up dropping off uh, from from uh, from this kind of work so this this is a really a, 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 a big challenge and it it requires quite a huge dedication uh for somebody to uh uh commit uh, in this kind of uh, work um the next challenge that we've been facing is uh, at policy level where uh there we've observed limited commitment from governments but in our observation, we've noted that this limited commitment from our government, especially, is due to lack of awareness by those policymakers. I think there's not uh, uh, West Order based epidemiology being relatively new, especially in the low income uh, uh, countries, um, has not really uh, tickled the mind of the uh, of those that are responsible in the policy making. So, most of the times, government officials are not. Uh, are willing to support uh, because they have really not appreciated the value uh, of uh, wastewater based epidemiology, and hence there is need really uh, to expand awareness or to promote awareness among uh, policymakers so that uh, WBE can receive the attention that it requires. And then we have also noted uh, problems at technical level. Uh, at technical level, number one has been an uh, issue of sampling phlegm. Uh, in this case, uh, assuming we are sampling a community, the question has always been, where do we sample? Which community, I mean, which community members do we target? So, because we we, we, we are operating in a very densely populated uh, communities and each individual member within that community or each individual family has their own toilet. And we may have, we may go to a community and find that there are uh, 500 toilets. Now, which toilets do we, or do, which intra trains do we target in our, in our sampling frame? That has been uh, very difficult. In our discussions, we've noted that the, uh, if, if we can target sites where community members congregate, for example, a school, a market, maybe we can get some something that can actually um, be of, um, of, of, of use. And uh, the other challenge that we've uh, encountered is uh, limited equipment. Most cases, um, uh, we've not been able to um, uh, to uh, get labs that have BSL-2 
and even the uh, the gold standard, the PCR uh, uh, gadgets, as well as reagents. And uh, we believe that if we promote the North-South partnership uh, within those partnerships, we should be able to unlock some of the resources that we need in terms of um, uh, equipment and infrastructure. And the third uh, uh, challenge in terms of technical is uh, the human uh, capacity. We have also noted that there's limited human capacity in the country to look at the, um, uh, the laboratory work, as well as to look at some of the uh, in, uh, data that we we, we, we collect. Uh, so uh, we've uh, been in negotiation with uh, various partners to see if we, uh, we can have our members uh, trained in the laboratory management, sample analysis and other things, as well as in the um, uh, data handling and the um, interpretation. And then the, um, we've also noted that when we try to do a comparison between our wastewater data to the clinical data, the clinical data is often unstructured and, uh, and in most cases you cannot really depend on the available clinical data. And in this case, we've uh, tried to engage the government officials so that maybe the, we can try to strengthen the data digitization so that data actually are collected at the uh, one single point, uh, which is accessible uh, by uh, those that want to use it. And then there's also uh, an issue of uh, logis logistical challenges. Uh, um, in, the, in, uh, in, uh, in this kind of work, we've noted that most of the reagents and consumables that we use, including equipment, these ones must be sourced uh, from outside Africa. And uh, in our experience, sourcing these items, it usually takes months uh, before those consumables arrive. And this is a, a really huge challenge in, uh, regarding uh, setting up of um, uh, Nansua, the West Order Surveillance System in Malawi. And also that's related to the, uh, to the availability of Forex. So there are times where uh, forex is generally unavailable and we want to buy some reagents some primers we are unable to buy because we cannot just send money uh to uh let's say to the uk or us uh, when we're looking for some other things and we if we succeed to buy let's say some set of equipment for example a pcr machine and other things we have no people locally to maintain or to service those items and that's also a bigger challenge uh, when we are trying to set up uh, these Oftentimes, we've also had the issues uh, with the IBR, uh, I mean, IRB, uh, where um, uh, it takes unnecessarily long uh, to get the, your research approved. Uh, and this this really derails the process of um, uh, setting up um, a wastewater surveillance system. And we've, um, um, we've um, published some of these um, uh, in, uh, uh, in some of the papers and the uh, I think the team here will share a link of uh, some of the papers that we've uh, uh, come up with, uh, which really uh, look at the, uh, some of the challenges that uh, we've, have, we've encountered uh, to set up uh, a non-sewered uh, waste order uh, surveillance system. Now, as a pilot, uh, we basically uh, set up a waste order uh, uh, based pathogen uh, surveillance project. And the, in this project, our goal was really to build capacity, number one. And the, uh, we also wanted to determine the feasibility of doing waste order surveillance in a, in a low resource uh, laboratory setting. And at, ultimately, we also wanted to see if we can model uh, the waste order surveillance data to the clinical uh, uh, data um, uh, for decision making process. Um, the project. Uh, basically commenced in 2022, and we had the uh, targeted five pathogens, Vibrio, Coli, Salmonella, Typhi, uh, TB, Measles, and SARS-CoV-2. Um, we were collecting samples on a weekly basis at three sites, and these were processed at BSL-2. Fortunately, we had the uh, uh, well-wisher uh, donating a BSL-2 to our lab. Uh, initially, we had focused that, the, I mean, we had planned that we would do our detection using PCR, but unfortunately, due to the delays that we uh, we, we we experienced to uh, to procure reagents, uh, we had to immediately switch into doing uh, culture based methods. So for the culture based methods, we only targeted Vibrio coli as well as Salmonella typhi. We couldn't do uh, the uh, TB because it required uh, the BSL three. So our limitations there. Uh, we could not just uh, proceed with. So we proceeded uh, with the, those two pathogens. And the, after doing the culture and the biochemical tests, we ultimately uh, received the PCR reagents and we were able to confirm um, those isolates using um, uh, PCR 
at some stage. And in terms of um, in terms of um, now implementation timeline, because since I mean, because this was just a pilot, we noted that uh, for us to move from the uh, preparation to a point where we have we have concluded the nature of the pathogen. It took us roughly about ten days, and this is the case in a in a in a in a, in a low resource setting. We can we could not. Uh, I know that in other labs, the other labs that have been before this level of detection can actually be done in a day or two. But in our case, because of uh, the limitations that I've talked about, the whole chain it took us about um, uh, ten days. Uh, during the pilot stage. And then uh, ultimately to set up the whole work to have everything in place uh, from uh, stakeholder consultations to a point where we were able now to do uh, uh, to, to, to do the sample analysis and also uh, process the data and the compare that data with the clinical samples, it took us about 24 weeks, which is quite long. And the, this is um, really going through all the stages, including ethical clearance, IBR. So because of the delays that we experienced at all levels, it took us uh, quite a long time uh, to have our system in place, uh, to have our data, and to be able to uh, link our data to the uh, clinical uh, uh, data. Um, so more recently, uh, we've uh, also uh, um, uh, shifted. Now we've uh, gone into genomics. Uh, we are using um, amino ion in this case, uh, where we collect our samples, uh, extracting nucleic acid. We filter first and extracting nucleic acids. And then he proceeded to do library prep and the uh, uh, sequence the data. Unfortunately, I cannot share the data now because we are in the process. We did our initial genomics analysis last week, and the, this time around, we are we are really uh, uh, trying to uh, play around with the data and see what are some of the pathogens that are there in the data. So this is um, what we the, our initial pilot we did uh, for six weeks. So this is um, um, uh, sequencing data for six weeks uh, to see really what are the pathogens that are there beyond the, the, the five pathogens that we had the, uh, initially targeted. Um, our future plans, uh, we have uh, some plans and uh, one of the plans is really to expand our surveillance uh, to other sites now that we, uh, our capacity is more or less being built up now is being enhanced. So we, we believe that we can expand the surveillance to, to other areas. And we also are thinking that we should build a more robust uh, metagenomic sequence, sequencing capabilities by uh, procuring a more robust sequencing platform uh, in future when resources permit. And we also hope that we can develop a dashboard uh, where we can post our weekly uh, uh, data. And then uh, in terms of capacity building, we believe that the uh, through our collaborations, uh, we already have one member who has been sent to USA to do a, to undergo a training in um, in uh, in bioinformatics. So uh, we believe that if we strengthen our co collaborations with our partners, we should be able to be supported in terms of capacity building, uh, both in the laboratory management as well as the uh, bioinformatics. And the. I would like to acknowledge all those, uh, the team from the Malawi University of Science and Technology, uh, and the Dr. Rochelle from uh, uh, University of Louisville, who has been very instrumental uh, in um, helping us set up um, our wastewater uh, pathogen surveillance um, uh, system, and also uh, the Rockefeller Foundation, which provided the initial funds uh, for the piloting. I thank you so much. Thank you so much, Petros for sharing your uh, your insights. And uh, yeah, also looking forward to, to uh, see uh, the results of the sequencing uh, data, of course. Uh, we quickly move on to um, to India, uh, to uh, Dilip Abram's uh, presentation. You will see that we are um, running late. Um, so the, the Q&A session will be short, but you will also see that all the uh, authors, uh, presenters are doing their best uh, to give written uh, responses to your questions. So if you look in the Q&A, you'll see a lot of questions already answered uh, and, and ongoing in answering. So uh, without further ado, Adilip, um, the floor is yours or the screen is yours. 
Uh, hello, everyone. I am Dilip. I am a clinical microbiologist working at the Christian Medical College, Bello. Uh, it's a town in South India. Uh, and the title of my presentation is Wastewater Surveillance from Vellore, India, Utilities, Insights, and Challenges. Kind of a broad topic. I thought the best way to go about it would be to illustrate some of the work that we have done in Vellore. And then uh, you can see how I, uh, it led to my conclusions. And you can uh, agree or disagree with me. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. So uh, Vellore is, uh, is a district in uh, Tamil Nadu, which is a state in South India. So our the wastewater surveillance that we have here is spread across 24 wards. A ward is an administrative sub subunit in the Velu city. And the area is spread over 16.25 square kilometers with a population of 200,000, an average population density of 26,000. Uh, next, slide, next slide, please. Right, so this is the work that we've done in from 2018 to 2020. So we have been, this is, uh, so I joined the wastewater team in 2020. So this is before my time. So we have been interested in wastewater surveillance for a long time, for mainly for polio, uh, rotavirus, and hepatitis uh, A. We got interested uh, from 20, 2018 and 2019 onwards, basically for looking at uh, trying to do some burden estimation of typhoid in this uh, study area. This is because we knew that the typhoid vaccine vaccines were coming up. So that is the motivation for more, most of our wastewater surveillance uh, work. Next slide, please. So. Uh, in 2020, we had a uh, collaboration with Imperial, Dr. Nick Grassley in Imperial College. We wanted to investigate the optimal design for a typhoid or paratyphoid environmental surveillance to inform vaccine introduction. There is a multi-site study in India, Malawi, and Ghana. And uh, basically, our aim was to figure out which are the uh, site characteristics that correlate with detection of salmonella typhi. And uh, can we uh, correlate that with clinical load? Next slide. So we had already done uh, for the last year spatial mapping of the sewage network. So you can see uh, we cannot define our sewage as a sewer or non-sewer communities. Basically, the sewage for, flows into these open drains, and like Sudhir was saying, uh, you know we, uh, we use a lot of water. Therefore, this uh, there's a lot of uh, flowing wastewater, but there's a lot of uh, solid power, solid compartment of the wastewater is also high. Sometimes these small channels get um, uh, like get plugged, and then people will have to remove the sludge for these uh, drains to flow again. So we can we char characterize the drains in the three levels based on the sizes, uh, small, small, medium, and large. And uh, collaboration with uh, Imperial College allowed us to integrate the spatial mapping with high-resolution high uh, digital elevation models. And this uh, allowed us to uh, select 40 sampling locations and allowed us to correctly map the catchment area that's upstream of the sampling locations. Next slide. And our initially, we were doing, uh, uh, we had 40 sampling sites. We are sampling once a month. We were doing both trap sampling by Musa and grab sampling by membrane filtration. Next slide. Now, the problem with looking at sal salmonella typhi is what uh, we need to define a positive sample. Earlier, we had used the Baker primers, that is the star G primer, in which the target was the fimbrial, fimbrial uh, gene. But uh, as you can see by the work by Satish Nair in the UK, Regardless of whatever target you used, he tested these multiple targets along, along a bunch of uh, salmonella serovas, and, and there's not a single target that is specific for typhi alone. So eventually, we zeroed in on these three targets: TTRs, TVIB, and Stargi. And we figure and we decided that a sample is positive only if all typhi, all these targets are positive. And uh, and we went ahead and validated the PCRs, and we are uh, ready to. Next, next slide, please. And as I mentioned, this study happened during 2020 and 2021. And you all know what happened during that time. Uh, the pandemic happened and we only had the problem was, uh, our aim was to correlate the environmental surveillance detection with the clinical incidence. But as you see, there was only a total of 11 cases in that entirety of year because of, because of the lockdown, there was a huge disruption in human activity and in healthcare seeking behavior. So we only had 11 cases. And meanwhile, the previous enteric, uh, enteric fever uh, surveillance that happened in the same area showed 146 cases over two years. So you can see how huge of a disruption this was. So we knew that we were in trouble, that we will not be able to fulfill the primary objective of our study. So we had to go to look at other methods to, uh, to look at clinical incidence of typhoid. Next slide. We, in order to correlate, we, we looked for uh, HLYE IgG, 
This is a novel technique that was developed by uh, uh, Jason Andrews group at Massachusetts. And uh, basically, uh, you, uh, we don't have time to go into it, but basically by doing a cross-sectional zero survey and measuring the HLY IgG, we are able to uh, kind of estimate the population level zero incidence over the last one year. And uh, you know, there's a paper by MJOY uh, et al. out, and you can uh, read more about this. Uh, next slide. Right, and so this is the ES positivity for this particular study during 2020 and 2021. You can see the membrane filtration positivity is around 7.5%. Musa positivity was almost twice of that. You, you can see the, uh, the graph at the lower right. The uh, gray bars are the clinical cases, and you can see these clinical cases are not clustered spatially or temporally. Um, you can see the positivity of the uh, wastewater by grab sample and trap sample. And you can see there is, you, can, you cannot see any visually any correlation between the cases, but you can see in the graph above that, you know, uh, despite just prior to the monsoons and during the monsoons due to the dilution effects, the positivity actually came down. So this is my uh, final slide, my conclusions from all these uh, things which I said. Um, so basically, they divided into three. What are the challenges? What are the insights that we had over the last three years? And what can wastewater surveillance be used for, at least for the Indian setting? Now, the challenges that we had based on the uh, spiking studies that you can see, regardless of what you read from other uh, countries, we need to validate the method at your own site because the sample matrix, even within a country, vary a lot. And you need to train personnel at your own level. And um, I, this, this was an educational experience for us for scaling up because, you know, when you scale, initial study was around 40 sites uh, sampled once monthly. The second study of 50 sites sampled twice monthly. And, you know, scaling up is not uh, uh, linear. It is kind of exponential. So uh, the double the sites you have, you might have to increase, or, uh, increase your, um, your, your, your reagents and your infrastructure by four times. And automation is a no-go. You cannot do automation, especially in South India. Automation removes the need necessity for untrained labor, but it increases the necessity for trained labor. And even if you have an automated machine, you'll have one person in the entirety of South India that can service that machine in case of failures. And so it's not viable for us. So all of this needs to be my, taken, uh, time management, reagent procurement. Supply chain is another issue. Um, I, over the pandemic, most of us in LMICs have become kind of cynics when it comes to supply chain. We know that we are at the fag end of the uh, supply chain and we, we, should, we should learn how to deal with that. We need to plan accordingly. Um, yeah, QPCR val uh, val validation. And another thing, I don't know uh, about other people, but we had, for example, we know that which every every free store of DNA extract, there'll be some law of, law, some loss of nucleic acid. But we found that um, uh, and a high, by uh, a huge amount of loss of nucleic acid when multiple feed stores of DNA extracts or uh, RNA extracts from wastewater. So if the initial CT value is around 30, the next CT value after one free store will be 33 or 35. So th that's something to note. And then uh, much more broadly, we need to define what is a positive sample. Is it for SARS-CoV-2, is it just N1 or is it N1 plus N2 for uh, typhoid? Is it just one, one, one target that you define as a positive sample? Because you know you cannot uh, culture typhoid from a wastewater sample. For Vibrio cholerae, we actually have eight targets. So you know that's uh, another uh, headache. So that's something that needs to be defined. Then how do you normalize? I mean, is the increase in positivity due to an actual increase in the clinical incidence or basically increase in the flow rate or many people pooping at that time? So that's something that does a challenge. Then there's other challenges, communication, public health personnel. Frankly, over the last three years, uh, the attitude towards wastewater surveillance is just extremes. Either childish exuberance on one hand or absolute contempt from the other hand, usually by public health personnel. Recently, just, uh, things are better. You know, uh, there's cautious optimism uh, and you know, kind of realism sinking in even on the public health side. And that needs to be followed up. So what are the insights that we had from the last three years? Uh, first one is that sampling frequency and methodology would need to fit with defined use case and setting of ES of uh, wastewater surveillance. And this is what do I mean by that? Just because you know you think you're an ex uh, I think I'm an expert in wastewater surveillance of typhoid does not does not make me an expert in wastewater surveillance of SARS-CoV-2 because the setting of each disease in each uh, area and each uh, and the implication of wastewater surveillance is uh, way different. And even for data analysis, right? Uh, maybe for uh, outbreak 
outbreak detection and for SARS-CoV-2 uh, time series analysis would be appropriate. For uh, typhoid, we, we have seen that it's not appropriate. The high amount of variability of detection and uh, molecular targets should be chosen after thorough uh, literature review. And delineation and description of catchment. So we have lots of uh, waste water uh, papers from India. But very few of them have uh, data on what are the actual catchment areas and what is and how we correlate to clinical surveillance data. So these two personal to use, utilize this particular data. And the other thing is, how do we define the action? What is the threshold above which action should be taken on the public health level? And how do you define what is the action taken on the public health level? So these, uh, on the, because of lack of time, I'm going to stop, uh, cut short, and uh, happy to answer any of the questions. Thank you. Super. Thank you very much, uh, Dilip. Um, th yes, the, uh, in, in the interest of time, I don't think we have uh, time for the Q&A session because we have, are already running over our scheduled webinar uh, time. Um, <coughs> I think, um, as I said in the, in the chat, uh, the authors, the presenters have done um, a great job in trying to answer your questions in the Q&A in, in written format. Uh, so please have a look. And um, I think uh, th it was great to see these examples of uh, the, the opportunities of uh, wastewater surveillance and also the value of wastewater surveillance, um, if we can call it wastewater, but uh, th uh, th th this type of environmental surveillance in the, in, uh, the non-sewer settings. And um, it is amazing to see uh, that uh, there are also the possibilities and the opportunities uh, for um, collecting samples and providing information on the circulation of um, different uh, diseases, uh, infectious diseases, and uh, introduction of new variants. Uh, so th I think this is really uh, has been a very promising uh, webinar. Uh, showing the, the the opportunities, also uh, of course discussing the challenges, uh, particularly the challenges in in sampling and knowing the representativeness of the the population that you are sampling. But with that, I think um, uh, we will close this webinar and thanking all of the uh, participants uh, for your uh, attention, for your active um, uh, participation by asking questions. And um, hope to see you um, in the next IWA webinar or on the next um, IWA cluster activity on wastewater surveillance. Thank you.